welcome everybody to the July meeting of the Library Marketing Book Club. Thank you so much for coming. If you are able to pop on your camera, if you haven't, uh, please do. It'd be great to see your smiling face um, and we'll get going. So uh, we have, as uh, you all know, we have a wonderful guest with us today and I'll take a moment to introduce her and then uh, and then we can get going. So uh, Brittany Hodak is an award-winning author, entrepreneur, and customer experience speaker who's delivered keynotes across the globe to organizations including American Express and the United Nations. Uh, she's worked with some of the world's biggest brands and entertainers, including ones you've certainly heard of, Walmart, Disney, Katy Perry, and Dolly Parton. She founded and scaled an entertainment startup to eight figures before exiting, and she is the former chief experience officer of experience.com. Forbes said of her debut book, the one that we read, Creating Superfans, if you have customers, you need this book, period. And I absolutely agree. So uh, welcome, Brittany. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you have a little um, something you'd like to say to uh, everybody, and uh, please go ahead. Well, thank you so much, Chris. I just want to say I am so thrilled to be here with you all. I grew up um, at the library constantly. Uh, I grew up in a suburb of Fort Smith, Arkansas, and I will never forget like all of the happiest moments of my life were when I got to go check out 25 books at a time because that was our max. And I would get like 25 Dr. Seuss books and read them all in like a day and a half. And just every day was begging my mom to take me to the library. And back in the, the 80s and early 90s, um, you could just like drop your kid off. I'm guessing most most of you don't have parents who do that anymore. It's probably highly frowned upon. Um, but all the librarians knew me and knew that, you know, my mom would be back in three or four hours and I would just like read my way through all of the rooms in the meantime. So um, I have librarians in my family. Um, I have friends that are librarians. And as I said, I have so many amazing memories, both from when I was a kid and now with my own kids uh, in libraries. So I just want to say thank you all, not just for being here today, but for the work that you do. It is so important. Uh, it is so meaningful. And I know that right now you're all probably inspiring the next generation of authors who a couple of decades from now are going to get to see something that they've written on library shelves. So thank you all for, for all of the work that you're doing in your communities. Thanks, Brittany. That's wonderful. And yeah, it's a, it's a cool industry to work in. Um, and yeah, sometimes there are still parents, certainly are, are kids that just come <laughs> to the library. Uh, we definitely still have that. Um, and you may be happy to know that, I don't know how all systems, but many systems now, it's 50 or 100 books that you can check out at a time. Wow. So. <laughs> oh yes that would have made yeah. now as a parent I'm like how like how am I going to keep track of even 25 <laughs> books like it seems like such a huge number but as a kid I was like 25 books I'm going to read you know seven of these yeah. before we even get home in right. the car like that's not enough to get me till tomorrow <laughs> Exactly. So, um, so first, I always like to start by just kind of throwing it out to the group and uh, seeing, um, you know, what are your impressions of the book, or, you know, again, we have the author here. So what questions or, you know, feedback would you like to give Brittany? Please, not everybody all at once. <laughs> I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed the book quite a bit and I was very inspired um, and I am trying to work on starting a program now like some sort of super fan situation to try to get like basically an ambassador program started um, so yeah I just kind of had a revelation when I was listening to the audiobook the other day so I'm trying to put something together like that. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. And I'd love to, to workshop ideas with you right now in real time if you want to do that. So thinking about um, you know, what traits you might be looking for in those ambassadors and what it is that you might want them to do in terms of the goals that you would have for the program in the community. So whether that's getting new people into the library for the first time, whether that's getting people who haven't been in in a few years back or uh, creating more of a sense of community of events that are happening, um, sort of knowing what those goals are and then reverse engineering it so that you know exactly who you would be looking for to be those ambassadors and what it is that you would want them to do to help that program meet that success criteria that you outline. 
Yeah, for sure. I think um, as far as the goal for what the program would do, like you said, bringing new people into the library that maybe don't already come. Um, and then also just in the current environment, like just creating as much pro library vibes as we can, because we've had a lot of challenges uh, with book challenges in our personal system and it's everywhere these days. So um, when I was talking to my boss about it, that was her big push for it was like, yes, anything we can do right now to get people on our side is is absolutely a good thing. Um, and so my initial thought was just to just to launch it is to kind of see who's already coming to us. So run a report of like who are already our super fans, who's checking out a bunch or who's here all the time and reach out to them first and sort of pitch it that way of like, thanks for being a super fan. And I'm, I want to do some sort of like maybe a tote bag or something. And then from there, hopefully it catches on and people are interested in it and see other people that have already got the bag or what have you. And then setting some sort of like criteria of how you can become one yourself is the vague idea. I love that idea. I think you have the foundation of, of a really great program idea there. Um, what I would say is that you will probably find when you run that analysis that those super fans are going to fall into a few different buckets because you're serving so many different types of customer avatars within your community. Um, so you may have, for example, some people who are coming in a lot because they have kids, some people who are coming in a lot because they have a small business, others who are coming in uh, maybe for something that's like not book related. They're coming in from the movies or the audiobooks or something else. Um, so as you're asking uh, people to, you know, perhaps be a part of this program, be sure to get some some uh, information from them in the form of just really like straight up qualitative interview like hey what do you love about the library and what would you say to a friend of yours who hasn't been to the library in a while you know ask asking them questions for each of the audiences that they are likely to resonate with with their story because there are other people like them so other you know parents of young kids or other um you know entrepreneurs or other um teachers or you know whatever the whatever the situation is um because one thing that you will all start to see as you pay more attention to your super fans is that it is almost never like one uh, demographic trait that ties them together. It's going to be more of like psychographic things uh, that tie them together. So you're going to have uh, super fans who are there for different reasons and have different life situations. And the more that you can learn about super serving each one of those, the more you'll be able to, to grow those individual pillars and pods of finding more people in your community who have similar needs and wants as each of those different types of super fans that you've identified. Definitely. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Wonderful. That's a great, thank you. It's a wonderful start. It's great, Kelly. That's awesome that you're looking to do that program. I know we've talked about doing ambassador programs um, before, and I've heard, heard a lot from other libraries. Um, so uh, that's uh, fantastic. Thanks so much, Brittany, for uh, that great advice. And, and I'm sure it'll be useful for a lot of us. Um, anybody else have any initial thoughts about the book or, you know, or questions for Brittany about, uh, about super fans and how to, how to make that um, what it's all about? Hi, I am from the uh, community college, and so I am looking at this and that lens and right off the bat where you're talking about that money changes everything. How does that translate to a library situation where the money is punitive? We're not trading something for the money that they want, <laughs> except freedom to borrow more things. Um, how does that you know, what is the library's currency? I, I, my brain just could not quite wrap around that. Yeah, well, when I was talking about money changes everything, it was really um, the idea of people feeling that you have to pay people to become uh, influencers who connect with your brand. So the idea of there needs to be like a transactional relationship here in which I'm paying you for the things that you're doing. So removing kind of um, money from the scenario all together, um, because as you're saying, um, the 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 for for you all, the act uh, of of that transactional relationship is they've gotten the library card, they're doing the borrowing. So um, you would certainly be an exception to that, in that 
um, someone is your customer without having spent money, um, what they've given you is, is their time, right? They've come in, they've they've taken the time to apply for the library card to get it. Um, they've engaged uh, with your system uh, that way. And where I think that whether you're spotlighting people who are already super fans uh, or you know already coming into the library quite a bit or um, trying to attract new people, something that might be really fun is to focus on the recommendations of those certain subsets of people. So the same way that other brands uh, might work with influencers um, or paid um, marketers to, to do some of that ambassador work, um, you're essentially saying to someone, I want to partner with you because uh, I see that you've got really great taste. Like I, I, you know, I was just noticing the books that you've checked out over the past three or four months. You've really got your finger on the pulse of X, Y, Z. Would you consider um, letting us publish your recommendations for what's coming up next? Or would you consider letting us record a quick video of you uh, basically saying why you love this book and who you think should also read it? So um, there is not that money changing hands uh, for customers. And like you said, in many cases, unless it's punitive, um, but that's perfectly all right. You would certainly be an exception to the rule. Um, and then as far as the money changing things with the influencers, uh, just know that that also would would not apply so much in terms of like paying them um, to, to, to be a, a spokesperson or to create that content for you guys. Also, because your um, your operating in a way to where the currency is more about the, uh, the the time and the effort to to become a member rather than actually buying something. Yeah. So. Yeah, thank, you. Hopefully, thank you. Yeah. Hopefully that helps you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Brittany. Yeah, and good question, Tammy. Because yes, it is true. It's it's uh, it's difficult to uh, match up sometimes some of the marketing and measurement that we do, because we don't have those number figures um, in the same way that most other businesses do. So, yeah, how do we quantify? You know, how do we reward people and quantify people um, by time and and give those things? I think that's great. So, well, and I think um, I'm also yeah. Saying- to the importance of each of your roles because you're the ones and your staffs are the ones who are in there, you know, and like I, I, I still remember the names of many of the librarians that uh, I was fortunate to get to know over the years. So you all have your finger on the pulse in a way that, you know, a lot of businesses don't because they're, they, they don't have that human human interaction. They're not paying attention. Um, so even though a lot of your transactions, I'm sure, are happening digitally and electronically now, um, being able to tap into those people that you know are still coming in or those people who are sending you email messages and reaching out to you, um, just know that every single one of those relationships is the opportunity to get that ripple effect from that individual relationship with that borrower. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, that's fantastic. That's great. Um I think, uh, you know, if anybody else has any other questions, pop them up in the chat or um, just interrupt, please, or, or use your hand raise. Um, but, you know, I, I do have a bunch of notes, so I'd be, you know, I, I'd love to go through some of the things um, from the book. Uh, so, oh, one thing I'm very curious about, Brittany, so, so there's the story in the book. Um, again, if y'all haven't, you know, whoever may not, may it may still be uh, on the hold list or something, um, but there's the book about the Costco experience and <laughs> And, um, you know, and which uh, I think some of us can say it can feel very familiar that uh, sometimes, you know, you go through the you go through to try and get a card or try and get a membership and you're presented with a lot of upsells and a lot of other things. Um, One thing I'm curious about that, Brittany, is since you've written the book, has Costco ever contacted you? Have they ever heard this and (laughs) reached out and said, hey, we're sorry? (laughs) I have not heard from Costco. That's really funny. Uh, somebody the other day was like, did you send one to like their chief customer officer? And I have not. Um, no. And I almost didn't include that story in the book because I didn't, um, you know, I didn't want to like go on the record of, of sharing negative sure. experiences with too many companies the way I, I did with the, the Nordic track sales guy yeah. or not sales guy, but delivery guy. Uh, but I thought it was important to include those real life examples because we've all had them as customers. And, you know, 
you're never going to be able to remove 100% of the friction, especially at the beginning of a customer's journey. And I'm sure that resonates with all of you when people are like, what do you mean I need a utility bill? Or what do you mean I have to bring this in? So um, my advice is to communicate as much as you can of that upfront. Make sure people know what they're looking for. Um, you don't want to scare anybody away by making it seem really hard, but to say, you know, hey, we would absolutely love for you to become a member. And and uh, when you've got 10 or 10 minutes or so to set aside, we'd love to walk you through that process and to expedite it, make sure you've got X, Y, Z, whatever. So you're letting them know you're clearly setting a time expectation. So somebody is not like, oh, I thought it was going to be 30 seconds. Here I am eight minutes later. And if you say, <laughs> you know, you've got 10 minutes and then you finish it in seven, all of a sudden somebody's like, oh, that was even easier than I thought. So a lot of times exceeding somebody's expectation is able to be traced directly back to managing their expectation, letting them know, because a lot of times as customers, especially at the beginning of a journey, we just don't know what we don't know. And so uh, we think something's going to be easy. And then in fact, when it feels difficult and then it's like, and another layer and another layer and another layer, it's very easy to get discouraged or to leave before we complete that journey. Yeah, it's a good, no, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, that's great advice. And yeah, I don't, I don't know that we do that in our library um, as far as setting the time expectation and seeing what they do. And actually that's something that, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to go and see what that time actually is for some of these, because it could be different. It could, you know, it, we've been talking about, um, you know, those kind of things. And we have a couple of things in the chat. JD says, never had a patron mad about an upsell of a related program title. Um, yeah, if you could get people to do it, programs would would do much better. It is, yeah, it is good for, yeah, there are definitely some things that if you're listening, um, you know, right, Brittany, I mean, if you're listening, that's kind of, you know, you have in the book about um, interviewers who don't listen to the answers who, um, and just people who don't listen to what somebody else is saying. And, um, you know, kind of along those same lines, if you're listening to somebody and hearing those cues for a related program or title, that can be a great thing, right? Oh, it absolutely can. And, you know, thank you both JD and, and Jennifer for what you put in the chat. And, you know, JD, to your point, I think um, one of the things I talk about at length in the book is that your customer's experience is never going to be superior to your employee's experience. And that an apathetic employee is not going to create an engaged customer. And I think uh, particularly when you're talking about upsell opportunities, particularly when you're talking about letting people know how they can get more involved, it's imperative that the clerk understand not just what the program is, but the benefit to the customer so that they can talk about it in a way that lets that patron know why this is relevant to them. And to be on the lookout for things that are telltale signs like, oh, I, you know, they're coming in with a teenager. I need to let them know about this arts and crafts program that we have. Or, oh, you know, I see, I see this older couple constantly coming in together like that. They might be a great fit for, you know, this other thing or, you know, this sounds very morbid, but like, at what point am I going to talk to them about trying to get into the will because they, you know, have not yet been in here with kids and they look like they're in their eighties, <laughs> like all of those types of things that again, having a person uh, who, who, who's the eyes and ears on the ground to, to get to engage with your customers and know them is, is so critical, but ensuring that um, whoever it is at that touch point with the customer, whoever is going to be that liaison between everything that your library is and does and has to those people who you're trying to get even more deeply connected. Um, you've, that, that, that is a very, very critical role. I say in the book uh, that every single person on your team is the chief experience officer. Every single person is the chief brand officer. Um, and that is incredibly true when you're talking about those early interactions that someone is having when they're there for the first time or the second time, or they're, they're making a jump to, to be more committed uh, in a way that feels a little bit new and unfamiliar to them. It's even more important in those moments that you have someone who's leading with empathy, who understands um, how to, how to personalize that experience um, and is exceeding the expectation of those clients. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it is, it's so important. And it always, when and you can see when it works, you can see when it happens, when it makes the connection. And as you said, um, you know, of course, the, the sort of the overarching theme of the book of being where your story intersects with your customer's story. So um, yeah, by paying attention to what things are going on, it's great. And yeah, Tammy has something about uh, resetting passwords that yeah requires a lot of information. Um, yeah. So any of those things that you can do to set those expectations. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. It's, well, it's and it, it, it's funny, Tammy. So this is, you know, in the book, I talk about slow elevators and this <laughs> concept of like, you can't always control slow elevators, but you can communicate around them. Um, you may have no uh, control over what your system requires. Um, but if when you're creating those accounts for everyone, um, whether that's in person or online, if you say, hey, this is important, pay attention. It is very difficult to change your password. So take a picture of this on your phone, write it down, print it out, tattoo it on your dog, like whatever you have to do. But when you forget this password, it's going to sting a little bit. So reminding them um, or telling them up front and then reminding them of like, hey, this is important. Do not forget this password because you, you know, it's going to take MFA level effort, as you said, to, uh, <laughs> to, to reset it when you mess up. So um, looking for ways that if you know that those slow elevators are impacting customers um, again and again, if you can't make it faster, how can you, you know, how can you make it feel faster? How can you, you avoid people getting on that elevator and taking the stairs instead of you will. So um, yes, that's a great example, Tammy. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. And the other way you can make it faster is you can have a bunch of Legos dancing. Wasn't that the one elevator that the there physical you go, elevator you went into? So. <laughs> Distraction is a powerful drug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, Brittany, it's great. I mean, yeah, it does. It's funny. It seems like all this stuff is kind of the same. It's setting expectations, setting expectations up front is is becoming the most important thing that uh, that keeps people knowing what they're going to do and and uh, keeps them away from that uncertainty that. Uh, uh, that causes people to stop and then have to make a decision and then exit. So, uh, well, and, uh, and also yeah. apathy. And that's one of the things yeah. that I know you guys read about in the book that I talked oh, yeah. about over again, but it is so powerful. And, um, you know, I would argue that you guys are, are out there competing, not just with, um, you know, bookstores and not just with, with, with online uh, resources and, and repositories for people to get information. You're competing with everything. You're competing with, you know, Netflix and Hulu and the parks outside and, you know, every Kardashian, like there's so <laughs> many things out there vying for the attention of your customers. So to be able to concisely and in a compelling way, remind people of the meaningful, magical moments that you're creating and enabling because they're, you know, having this, this, this ongoing connection and relationship with each of your branches or locations. So, um, you know, looking for ways to consistently overpower that apathy to convince or remind someone that you can play a very relevant and important role in the things that are important to them in their lives. Brittany, along those lines, um, you know, I think uh, something that we talk about a lot among marketing people in libraries, um, and certainly in this group, is that a lot of the people that are um, working on the front lines, um, you know, they often don't think of themselves as salespeople. And you know, you're talking about how do you convince those people? How do you convince people? And how do you show that um, the attention rather than the apathy? So, you know, what are some things that we can do to? Um, and I mean, you've certainly already given us a bunch of them, but anything else specifically around that? Like somebody who just feels like, you know, I came here. And, um, you know, this is what I, and I come here and I sit here and I do this and I'm not really selling the library. I'm not trying to, um, you know, do that. And I think it's because people think selling sometimes is smarmy sounding, but, uh, what kind of things would you recommend when you're talking about, um, uh, you know, how, how to get people who may not be feeling that way, that, uh, that that is the role. Well, the first thing that I would suggest that they all do is read the book yes. <laughs> um, and then walk through the supermodel with every single one of those employees because um, it does selling does not feel like sales when you believe in the product, when you have a connection to it, because you realize that you're in a position to improve someone's life with the information and the access that you have. So um, just last night I was in... It's the Denver airport. I don't know. I have flown so much in this, this past week. I've been in like seven cities oh, um, all over North America in the past in the past wow. few days. Uh, but I was in 
Yeah, Denver, because I was flying from Palm Springs back home to Nashville. And um, every time I'm in, I'm in an airport, I like to go into the to the bookshop and see if they if they have the book. And they did. I was at, um, I believe, Tattered Pages or Tattered Page was was the name of this particular shop in the um, in the airport in Denver. And I went in. They had a couple copies of my book, so you know, I signed them and was talking to the to the employees. And um, one of the girls, her name was Yvonne, who worked there. Um, I said, so how long have you worked here? And she said, just a few months, but I love it so much. I'm such a bookworm and I can't believe I have a job where when there aren't customers in here, I get to read and I'm getting paid. And just that <laughs> little, you know, that just almost, she said it as if it was a passing thought, but what she was doing was sharing her story. And so the supermodel that I talk about in the book, start with your story, understand your customer story, personalize, exceed expectations, repeat. That framework is designed for every single person on your team. And when you help them identify their story, which to be honest, you should be doing before they even work with you, you should be doing that, you know, when you're interviewing them to make sure that they have alignment, you want to help elevate the way they think about their role and what they're doing beyond just a paycheck to a purpose. And if you can't get quite to that level of purpose, at least you can get to that level of passion. Why is it that you are here? You could be working anywhere. You could be doing anything, but you're here. Why? How can we make the world a better place for our community together? So help them really identify that purpose because everybody wants to feel like they're a part of something bigger. All of you are representing something that is very, very good and can be a force for good. It's not like you're like trying to get you know, kids to sell drugs or something like you <laughs> are doing something that should be easy to rally passion and support around. So that's the first part is the S start with your story. Mm -hmm. You understanding your customer story, again, going back to the empathy before the authority, having that curiosity to understand what are the kinds of things that your patrons are looking for? You know, what, what are they struggling with right now? How can you help? So Going and, you know, the rest on, on, on the way through, um, that's obviously the S and the U, but taking each employee through the supermodel saying, let's talk about the role you play because everything is experience and everyone is the chief experience officer. And we want to make sure that we're equipping you with all of the tools that you need to not just empower all of our patrons to have a better experience when they walk in, but also to enjoy your time here more as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's, yeah, that's excellent. Yes. And yeah. Um, and if you're on the email list, you got a copy of the supermodel playbook and uh, the super and the um, uh, discussion questions for the book. So um, yeah, you all have it right there and it's all ready to go and it's in the book too. So Donna, you had a question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not so much question, but sure. discussion point. It, full disclosure, I haven't finished the book yet. But that's um, okay, Donna. We know there are lots of other books vying for your attention at a, any given point, so you get a pass. <laughs> but um, my boss is in in the the like very tail end. At the end of December, she will have completed her MLIS, and one of the classes that she put off until like right now was the class in library marketing. Mm. And so for part of that class, she had to come up with this, you know, marketing model thing, you know, and basically, basically just a, a marketing plan for what does she want the library to accomplish. And she developed this marketing plan because like our service population is roughly 22,000, probably about 20% of our service population has a library card, only about 10% of our service population use their library card. Yeah. And, you know, so she's she's on this kick to get the, the people who are not using their cards back in and get the people who don't have cards to get cards, which is great. And it's like, I'm reading this book. And then she says, here's my marketing plan that we're going to use. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and I'm like, how do I get what I'm reading in the book into her marketing plan? <laughs> because the the goals that, that she wants to accomplish is to create super fans, but she doesn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> so 
Well, I, Donna, I'm going to repeat myself here and say a great place to start would be having her read the book. Um, <laughs> but taking a look at our marketing plan and asking what are the what are the specific measurable goals you want within each population and what are you doing to reach them? Because it's obviously you all know, not as simple as just saying, we're going to come up with a great postcard and send it out to all 22,000 people and all the right zip codes. Right. Um, because not the same thing is going to, to capture the attention of, of each different um, population of, of, of um, resident that you have uh, within your, within your service area. So um getting clearly defined on um, understanding those customers. What do they want? The 80% of people who don't have a library card, the 90% of people who aren't coming to a library, why, why aren't they? Is it because of an awareness issue? Like they don't, they don't know that the library is there. They don't know all of the services that you provide, or is it because they know and they don't care? And if they don't care, how can you overpower that apathy? What is the compelling point that you're going to be able to share with them? What are the resources that did excuse me, that didn't exist within your library system 10 or 12 or 18 years ago, uh, the last time they came in, that they would be shocked to learn about now. What are those things that you can do? How can you create a sense of community and a sense of meaning around your library locations based on serving needs that this population has? Because just like an awareness-driven campaign, as you guys know, the problem is never awareness, it's always apathy. Uh, Mm -hmm. What are you doing to connect your story to theirs in a way that's going to be meaningful and memorable? What are you saying that makes someone say, oh yeah, I should take 30 minutes out of my very busy Thursday to like swing by the library on my way home from work. So I think it's going to be a combination of things. We all know there's, there's no silver bullet. We all know there's no like one size fits all, but that's why it's so important to establish three or four different types of customer personas of people whom um, you know know that you are very uniquely positioned to serve well and separate your efforts to uh, make sure you're targeting the right potential customer with the right message at the right time. Yeah, that's yeah. And that's so that's back to you, Brittany, like in the book, you talk about um, the key to getting customers action is understanding attrition, right? I mean, is that kind of that same, that's that same theme and what Donna was saying, which is, um, yeah, you know, understanding why people are leaving and why people are going. Um, and kind of along those lines too of, of what you were saying and, and Donna's question, um, you know, June or June, September, um, we're coming up on September and September is library card sign up month. So this is a time that most of us here uh, will be working on different kind of campaigns to get people to, um, you know, to, to do this, to find people and get them engaged and get them into, um, you know, and, and see if we can raise library card, um, raise the number of people that have library cards. Um, but, and then, you know, so consequently raise how many times they use them. But um, one thing that you talk about um, there in the book, or it's actually a quote that you take in the beginning of one of the chapters. I can't remember. It's near the, it's, it's near the latter probably a third of the book. Don't worry, Chris. I have no idea what any of the chapters are either. I wrote so many versions <laughs> of this book that sometimes people will be like, oh my gosh, and what you said in chapter 13. And I'm like, can you please remind me what chapter 13 is, please? Because all of the chapter numbers moved and switched. And I've been honestly terrified to read it because I don't want to find like a typo or something that we missed. Uh. So I read it um, when I was in the audiobook version, and yes. that is the only time I've like actually read through the entire book. So don't worry, I wouldn't know the chapter either. You're just right. yeah. Uh, the first time I, I I read it, I listened, and it, that was awesome. So wonderful, wonderful way to to experience oh, the book. You. But it was the the quote from Ogilvy, and it was um, yes. don't address a customer as if they're sitting in a stadium. And I think you know it probably goes through some of the things we just talked about. But you know, is there something about that? So when we're thinking about um, when you're thinking about a, a membership campaign and, you know, a growth campaign, what maybe experiences can you share from your work with other companies that might do those kind of things or, or just what's your advice when you're doing that so that you're not doing that so that you're not talking to people like they're just um, just in a stadium? Um, you know, what are some ways to approach your community, uh, but try and, and keep it more, um, so it feels like it, you know, you're talking to me. 
Well, that is a great question. I think some of it comes back to what Kelly was asking about of, you know, identifying who those different super fans are, who are the people who are really uh, engaging with your with your library right now, who are, are, are primed to be great ambassadors, and then talking to them. People love sharing their opinion. If you ask, you're going to get such great answers. So um, one thing that I would suggest doing is <laughs> excuse me, if you're um, looking at attrition specifically, um, call some people who were super high frequency um, visitors and aren't anymore and find out why. Is it because, you know, now their kids are are in middle school instead of elementary school and so they have access to a library at school? Or is it because, you know, their reading group ended? Is it because, you know, what, what are some of these factors? Because I guarantee you there will be things that you did not know about. Some of them, which will be very easy fixes of, oh, we should bring, you know, we should move the the, the book club back from, from Wednesdays to Tuesdays because, you know, now that it's on Wednesday, say it conflicts with like this bowling thing or church or whatever it is. So ask, ask, ask your customers. I cannot yeah. stress that enough. And for National Library Card Sign Up Month, um, I might have like messed yep. the name up. That's but, it. But you nailed it. Okay, perfect. Um, I would highly suggest reaching out to other businesses in your community who have their own social following. So I'm sure you do things already, like where you have the girls dressed up like princesses that come in and like do the storybook hours and things like that. Um, what about what about your local um, humane societies and adopt, adoption shelters? Like, have you have you done things where you you know have the puppies come in and, and do a contest? Like, who looks the most like Clifford? Who looks the most like <laughs> Uh, what's the the one's name? Spot, the little yeah. cute yellow guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, looking for ways um, to to bring people in. You know, like everybody loves a dry run of their Halloween contest or their Halloween costume. Like, what are the oh, contests yeah. that you can do in September to have people dress like their favorite literary character? Finding ways to where you're going to be able to generate interests. Uh, in, in like an earned media standpoint. So PR, mm -hmm. maybe the local newspaper is going to come and take pictures. Maybe the local TV station is going to be there because you've got something cute going on, whether it's like a lot of kids, you know, dress up as the rainbow fish for, you know, rainbow <laughs> fish day, or like everybody comes and like does their best Eric Carl drawing, like whatever it <laughs> yeah. is. Um, there are pop culture events on the calendar nonstop. If you pick a few of them and find ways to engage your audience, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, I don't know what Vampire Day is, but I guarantee <laughs> you there is one. And I guarantee you a lot of people who haven't been in the library for a while, but loved uh, the Twilight books when they were kids, re-engaging with them saying like, you know, hey, come see what's changed. Like there are things that you can do to, to reach people in a way that's contextual to pop culture. That's awesome. Thank you, Brittany. That's fantastic. Really appreciate it. Um, but uh, yeah, that's great. And yeah, it, it, it's finding those niches and finding people and getting them interested and, and getting them where they are. I think that's that's wonderful. Um, we just have probably, you know, a couple more minutes with you. Not too many, not too much more time. We really appreciate your time today. Um, is there anybody else who has a, a quick last question for Brittany? Um, and then we'll do a couple things. Uh, we'll do a thing for a minute before we wrap up. Before we wrap up with Brittany, and then we can talk a little more about library marketing and how great this was. Well, um, how many people just is is everybody here on Angela's email list? Sure, yeah, yeah. If you haven't had a chance yet, um, she did on on her blog post this past week. She wrote about. Um, Mary from Gross Point, who's oh, also yeah. part of this group, but she's not here today. Yep. Um, and Mary has developed this like series of 10, I think it's 10 yep. um, emails that she sends out to new card holders yep. over like the course of four or six months or something. And just really highlighting the different services. And it has upped their like retention and and usage rate to like almost 70 percent i think um yeah 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 I love great that onboarding idea. without seeing that nurture sequence i would say have fun with it. Every one of you loves books or you wouldn't be a librarian. Have the messages be written in the voice of different either authors or literary characters, or maybe give people the choice. Say, you know, hey, you're going to get 10 emails. Would you rather them come in the style of Stephen King or rather <laughs> them come in the style of Judy Bloom or, you know, whatever it is. 
give people the opportunity to opt in because when you connect your story to theirs, there's a psychological shift that happens that makes them say, I feel like I'm a part of this. I feel like I'm co-creating this. I feel like um, I am more invested in this because I am consciously making these decisions. And also they care about what I think. They're asking me for my opinion. They're giving me the opportunity to choose my own adventure a little bit. I don't know if choose my own adventure is like, <laughs> a very dated reference, but if not, like so. the idea of telling people like, Hey, you get to choose your own adventure as part of this library adventure. I mean, how many of you guys are doing something right now for the launch of the Barbie movie? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. A lot of memes yeah, going every on. Hand a lot of Barbie displays. is over the world right now. <laughs> there are so many opportunities. I guarantee you guys, you have Barbie books. I'm sure at some point Mattel did a thing, but think about all like what books would Barbie read? Yeah. You know, why would she yeah. love them? Like, you know, Barbie has her dream house. What are your architectural digest type books? You know, Barbie loves fashion design. Barbie loves flowers. Like all of those things. Like, <laughs> yes, Barbenheimer. Um, I'm, I'm more on the, on the, on the Barb side of that. I got to admit, but you know, doing things like that, like have your like Barbie's dream book list that you're doing, find ways for you to attach yourself to things that are happening in pop culture to make yourself part of the conversation. Because when you do that, you're much more likely for people to share those posts on social media. You're much more likely for the local, you know, newspaper or TV station, um, or uh, whatever those channels are that are, that are important in your community. Uh, maybe it's book talk, maybe it's, maybe it's, you know, NPR, like whatever it is for the community that you serve, how are you getting their attention? How are you overpowering that apathy? How are you making your story relevant to their life at this moment in time? And there are lots and lots of different ways to do that. Um, but you want to make sure that you're constantly making it relevant to what is happening in pop culture. So I want all of you, you guys all have a little bit, even though the movie comes out tomorrow, it is still going to be Barbie's world for a while. So I want you to think about what that could mean to the audience that you serve in your branch. It doesn't mean you have to like wear head to toe pink. It doesn't mean you have to have the big like cutout that people can come and stand in. But I guarantee you there are ways for every single one of you to re-engage your current patrons and to get new people in the doors by thinking about how you can do something Barbie themed or Barbie centric at your location sometime between now and the end of the month of July. And then you can remind people that when the Barbie movie is out on DVD, they can rent it through your That's site. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, keep it going, definitely. So, oh. well, Brittany, um, is there anything? Um, is there anything you can share? I mean, I know, of course. Please read the book, share the book, um, uh, share the book with everybody. Anything else that uh, that we can do to stay in touch, to follow on, um, you know, other other advice, other things? Where where can we find you? You can find me at BrittanyHodak.com. That is where mm -hmm. all of my things are available. I'm so sorry. I keep coughing, you guys. That's okay. Thank <laughs> you. I appreciate you coming. <laughs> I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old. So <laughs> all of the germs in the world are, are always in my house, even when I haven't been flying all over uh, North America for, for, for a week nonstop. <laughs> Um, so I, yes, you can always find me at brittanyhodak.com. Feel free to reach out to me at any time. I'm just Brittany at brittanyhodak.com. Um, I have a podcast called Creating Superfans that will be back for its second season soon. Um, in about a month, we're launching uh, with season two, uh, where I always feature marketers that I think are doing fun and interesting things. Um, the last thing that I will say, because I saw a question from, oh, yeah. I forget who asked it, Tammy, um, ask about leveraging swag. Yeah, members. thank you. Um, one of my favorite things, I don't know if I have one here to show you. Um, have you guys ever done metal bookmarks? Has anybody? I have, I haven't done a metal bookmark. They're so fun. So here's a metal bookmark that I did for the launch of my book. And I made it look like a, uh, ticket because obviously the, uh, the, um, music tie-ins sure. and then on the back, I have the supermodel. I don't know if you guys can see that on the zoom, but, um, so they're really cool. They were like, I think I paid about $2 each for these because of all the customization. You could make simple ones for like 40, 45 cents. So doing things that like, imagine uh, like somebody who was, you know, a member of that, that advocacy or super fan program, you're going to yeah. give them their own custom bookmark with their name on it. That's got your library information on the front and on the back says, you know, Brittany Hodak, Franklin Public Library, cardholder number one, two, three, four. Um, that would be so cool, right? So making yeah. things that people are using. Think about the way 
the ways in which people engage with the books that they read when you're thinking about the swag that you do. Like that, you know, a book bag is a great idea, obviously, because you put your book in it. What else are people doing when they're reading? Do they are, you know, is it is it fuzzy socks? Is it a candle? Is it, um, you know, a pin? Is it a book light? Like what are the things that make contextual sense to the role that those books and other things that your patrons are borrowing play in their lives when they're engaging with your product? And that's where you want to, um, that is where you want to create swag, where it's at the intersection of your story and theirs. And also like, don't be afraid to like, you know, have fun with it. Like I was in um, Powell Books in Portland a couple of months ago and I spent so much money on all their books <laughs> because they had, uh, I mean, I bought, I bought a tote bag that says, I like big books and I cannot lie. <laughs> like, That's awesome. silly, like silly fun things like that, right? Like um, <laughs> those types of things. Yeah. That, are, are maybe like a little bit silly, a little bit irreverent, but people are going to remember them. People are going to use them. Um, things that, 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 you know, get someone's attention because yeah. anytime you create swag or merch, um, not necessarily, is it about just like bribing those students to get them in the door, Tammy, as you mentioned, but it's also how do I create something that they're going to use that other people are going to see and say, I want that too. So it's about that pass along effect. It's about turning that person into an ambassador for you because you've now created something that is going to be contextual in their lives that, that people are going to see and remember. Um, so those are, the, are are some of the types of things that you should ask yourself, like what is the ROI going to be on merch, not just for that person, uh, but also for everybody else. Don't be afraid to make it cool. You're, it doesn't have to just be about your name, your logo. Uh, it can be something fun and silly like that example that I showed and go like, go to your local independent bookstores, go to Barnes and Noble, like see what people are doing, see what people are selling that is non book related stuff in a bookstore. And don't be afraid to, to, you know, take ideas and inspiration from some of those things. I always say that the best marketers can get inspiration from anywhere. So like, you know, one of my favorite examples is there's a little local Mexican restaurant uh, by our house and they sell t-shirts that on the back says free queso. And if you buy the t-shirt, every time you wear the t-shirt and you get free queso. And I purposely have not bought the shirt because then I would eat queso all the time, but <laughs> for ideas that other people are, are doing that you can leverage into your library system. Thank you so much, Brittany. I uh, really appreciate it. That was absolutely wonderful. I know you have to go. So, um, but um, you're, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for coming to join us today. Thank you for writing the book. Uh, the book is wonderful and for recording the audio book. Uh, and not every book gets uh, a, an audio recording and it's fantastic. Um, so, and if there's anything you ever need from libraries, let us know and uh, we will uh, see you again soon online. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you so much for letting me know, Chris. I appreciate it. I appreciate all of your time. I would love to come to all of your libraries and I'm constantly on the road. So I'll go back and look at where everybody was and please let me know if you guys are ever in Nashville. Thank you. Yes, wonderful. Thanks so much, Brittany. We'll well, thank you very much. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, Charles. Talk to you soon. Bye bye. Um, anybody else who is still on, welcome to stay on. We have a few more minutes. Um, and uh, uh, um, okay. And now that she's gone, what did you think? What how how did how was that? <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. But what did y'all think? It would have been nice if we could have had more time with her. But, Always, uh, Donna. Yeah. I know. Oh. I agree. Yeah, we had 45 minutes and just wanted to be good to respect with that. But um, it's great that we got it. But you're right. I mean, I try and get as much time as we can. So, but, uh, but yeah. Any other thoughts about that? any other things about the book. Um, one thing is that Brittany in there mentioned, talks about birthdays and talks about half birthdays. Um, and initially when I listened to the podcast that she was on, um, it wasn't hers, but it was, she was a guest on another podcast. Um, they talked about her half birthday. So I think it would be really neat. Um, if all of us uh, put on your calendar, June 1st, that is Brittany's half birthday. So put a little reminder, send her a happy half birthday to Brittany at BrittanyHodak.com. I'm sure she would uh, be tickled by that. Um, so, but, uh, and along those lines, somebody was just telling me about, um, uh, do, do, I think we talked about this before. Does anybody do, birthday or anniversary emails to their customers? I'm not seeing a lot of head nods. We don't. 
So no, oh. we don't. Um, we've thought about it, but we just have never executed on it. Um, we're thinking about doing anniversary, um, like library anniversary, when your card, you know, card anniversary. And somebody that I was just talking to um, here said they were talking about the same thing. They were like, oh, we should send those out. And they got one from their credit union. Um, and it was just, you know, congratulations. And it was like 25 years that they had been there. Um, and they got an email that just said, congratulations, you've been a member of this credit union for 25 years. And there was no prize, no gift, no, you know, come in and get a free something. It was just that, but they remembered it because nobody else did that for them. Like the, none of the other financial institutions do that kind of thing for them. So you never know yeah. how you're going to stand out and how you're going to be a little memorable. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, so um, I think it was great. Well, um, before we go, uh, and if anybody has anything else to share, anybody have any marketing library marketing challenges that they're dealing with right now that they'd like to share with the group to see if you can get any feedback. I was trying to remember, did she talk about in the book this um, idea that you should show people the like the value of what they're getting from you? Like, um, like not just that you can get all of these great book recommendations, but what does book recommendations provide you with? Like, um, I think that was in there. There was something about that in the book, but I didn't want to say it earlier when she was here in case I got that from some other book. <laughs> Uh, that happens. <laughs> um, I think the same thing, but you know, showing the value. You mean like, is that in terms of, like is that if, in a like quantifying or or is you know like attempting to quantify or is it um, oh, like, um, you know think, focusing deeper on on what the value is that you're getting I, from the benefit? I think focusing deeper. Like the example might have been um, something would save you time, but yeah. what are you really getting from the time saved? You're getting more time with your family oh. or. I more time to do other like you know valuable i think things. that was her yeah that, that was familiar. yes yes that was a really good one yeah now that i'm thinking i think you're right yeah kelly i think you're right i think it was um yeah is that something that you've ever tried to do anna or are thinking about um maybe using in some communications Right. I was trying to come up with content for an ad um, mm. we put we've we trade ads with our parks and recs. So we put ads in their publication and we run theirs in ours. And I was trying to come up with something that was kind of more, you know, over, but always trying to be like overview of library benefits and not yeah. getting into the, you know, I don't know, hard to, it's really hard to reach everyone and show everyone what we, what we have. But so I was trying to figure out if I could kind of work that in like some sort of like, you know, inspirational or discovery or um sort of value of the library this bigger picture you know um of what you get by being part of a library what you get um yeah. it's just uh like what's the value of all of these resources you know i feel like uh, the example you brought up about book recommendations like the library is, I guess, the most personalized version of that, right? So if I am checking you out and I say, oh, I love this book, you should read this book, that's the only like face-to-face -face way you can really get that besides with friends, whereas, mm -hmm. you know, Goodreads or all the stuff you look at online is not the same. So maybe that angle, like it's the most personalized recommendation service in town or whatever. <laughs> I know with, with some of our like online resources, like with Ancestry Library Edition, and with um, like the great courses through Canopy and things like that, with all of those, we put something that says, you know, when, when we're actively promoting that, it says, mm -hmm. you, know, you can subscribe to the great courses for $199 yeah. a year, or you can get them free <laughs> right. through the library with Canopy. Always you good. can pay four hundred dollars a year for ancestry or you can come in and use the ancestry at the library for free and yeah. email the documents home to yourself right you know, and and so so like with with some of those resources that people could acquire outside the library on their right. own you know we just say hey by the way you know 
for yeah. our print and copy services are cheaper than Kinko's. We only mm-hmm. five cents yeah. a side for black and white. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tammy, did you have did you have some an example? Well, it was uh, the other Tammy mentioned it in the comments about the receipts. I think it's the yeah. I Love Libraries website has a calculator. You could, you know, uh, sometimes we'll print. I'll take a photo of a receipt and hide the name and put that out on social media. You know, look, this person borrowed three books, and so far this year they've saved this many dollars. And um, but the value of things. So I guess each item that you have available. Uh, has a different value. So if you have telescopes to borrow and you're sharing with Parks and Rec, it's, you know, you could explore the world with your library card. So there's a little different value with everything. We don't use the word free. Um, Mm. We say at no cost to you. So like, because there's a cost to the taxpayers. Right. Um, So like, we'll say, you know, come and use Ancestry at the library at no cost to you. I like the idea, Donna, of actually quoting the price of what it would cost if they did it in person. Um, yeah, yeah, I've done posts the, like uh, that, and they've always done really well. Of like, the, this is the cost, and this is free. You know, I've done that, and yeah. it's always and and like, you know, with the Ancestry Library Edition, especially, you can you can access the international records. Yeah, and I don't even know. I think right now. I haven't checked recently, but I think to get Ancestry World Edition on your own, it's like $2.99 every six months. Yeah. So it's it's, $600 a year to be able to access world records. And, you know, I mean, I don't know, unless you are like heavy duty (laughs) into genealogy, yeah. I don't know anybody who really needs to be paying that much money. Right. You know? Yeah, I think it's a great idea. And I think, you know, I do remember too, Anna, there's a post on the um, Facebook group and uh, it's about um, going fine free, but there was a lot of little things in there about, you know, welcome back this, welcome back that. And I also, we had a campaign also that had, I think some things you were talking about, like Tammy um, G, you were talking about that, or Tammy Gross, you're both Tammy G's, um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, talking about that idea of like, you know, discovery and and those kind of things. So yeah, so um, I'll see if I can find that, I'll share it, but because uh, I think that was neat, but you're right. I mean, I think that, you know, sharing that deeper, level that kind of almost philosophical level of you're getting the benefit here's the benefit you're getting from using the library and you know you're getting time back but what does that mean and i think that's awesome well it's it's four o'clock it's a couple minutes after four um uh anna lowry uh is it lowry or lowry anna how do you say your last name Lowry. Lowry, Anna Lowry. So Anna, um, you have won the book a couple times. Um, so I'm going to give you the, uh, the, the call. So pick a number between one and 12. Eight. Okay. One, two, three. Five, six, seven, eight. Erica, Erica Heinzelman. So, Erica, you win a copy of the book for next month, which is um, I can't remember the name of it right now. Conversations uh, that connect. Conversations that connect. I was just connect. looking at it. Yes, conversations <laughs> that connect. And uh, please come back again, everybody, because we are going to have the author uh, Brooke Sellis join us. Brooke is uh, I've heard her on podcasts a lot and um, seen the social media. And I think it's going to be another absolutely fantastic one. Um, but uh, thank you so much again. And next time we are at our regular um, fourth Tuesday. So um, look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you for coming on a different day today to see Brittany. And um, uh, I look forward to talking to you all again online and seeing you again next month. Have a great day. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.